Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Coffee and Tea with AARP Connecticut. It's our bi-weekly conversation and with which AARP staff and volunteers talk to Connecticut decision makers about policies and programs that are of interest to older residents. My name is John Erlinghauser, and I'm the Senior Director of Advocacy and Community Outreach here at AARP in Connecticut. And I'm very pleased to be joined by today by two of our great AARP Connecticut volunteers, John Wilson and Jim O'Brien. So thanks for being with us this morning, John and Jim. And uh, could you tell the folks a little bit about your previous professions, your previous life, et cetera, and, and a little bit about what you do for AARP here. And so why don't we start with you, John? Okay. Um, I have had two careers, one in environmental engineering, where I did a lot of project management work. And the second career after I retired from the first was to actually teach project management and a lot of computer software applications and business programs to help people improve their careers. I've been active in AARP for several years now. I came in on the fraud side of things and I'm very active in the Fraud Watch Network. I'm also active in the national fraud space where I spend a couple of hours every week talking to people who within the last 24 hours have been victims of fraud and try to help them recover. In addition to working with fraud, I'm also active in uh, in the Social Security issue, and I am also the AARP Volunteer State President for Connecticut, so I stay pretty busy. That's great. You're doing an awful lot for us, and we really appreciate it. And I know we have one of our other great volunteers, Jim O'Brien. So, Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and what you do for AARP? Sure. Thank you, John. I have been involved with AARP for at least 12 years. I've been retired a little longer than that. For 35 years, I worked for a union representing teachers in collective bargaining and uh, working on their personal issues. And and I have a, a lot of experience doing that over the years. In AARP, I began becoming active in our advocacy efforts, helping to promote laws that uh, that assist older Americans in particular. And that has expanded. Uh, AARP is very active in the in the whole legislative aspect of protecting people in, in the state of Connecticut. Uh, very active in not only in Fraud Watch, that's a huge effort, but helping people buy electricity from third-party suppliers in a, in a safe and effective way. I'm involved with the so, protection social security effort that's ongoing. And reached out to uh, federal legislators many times, asking them and talking to them about things that are important to AARP members. That's awfully great. So where where are you from, Jim? I live in uh, Cheshire, Connecticut. And how about you, John? What, what part of Connecticut are you from? I'm in Stratford, Connecticut. Great. So we, we uh, two of our great volunteers and we have volunteers all across the state and involved in so many things. And, you know, it's really important that we let people know that because they might not know much about what AARP does and what our volunteers do. So uh, this is just uh, great to, to hear about the wide array of volunteers we have across Connecticut. So today, for people that are regular viewers, uh, we usually have on policymakers or public officials to talk about various things. But today we're going to do something a little different. And, you know, it's uh, an even number year, so it's a federal election year. So we're going to discuss a little bit about AARP Connecticut's voter engagement campaign and the impact of age 50 plus voter has on elections. So why don't one of you tell me a little bit about AARP's 2024 voter engagement campaign? Sure, I can handle that, John. Voters 50 plus decide elections, and they are the majority of the voters in every election. They want to see politicians address their day-to-day challenges, like caring for their loved ones and protecting their hard-earned Social Security. That's why AARP is fighting to provide trusted, up-to-date information on when, where, and how to vote in the 2024 elections so Americans can make their voices heard. And that's just such important work. And, uh, you know, we've been doing this every year and, you know, we really appreciate all the effort that goes into it by our AARP volunteers and activists across the state. So you mentioned, John, a little bit about, um, you know, the fact that uh, we're going to be talking about the issues that are really important to the age 50 plus voter. So why don't one of you tell me a little bit about the major issues that the 50 plus voter cares about? There are two primary issues that we're concerned about for this election season. And the first is involved with Americans who are caring for their loved ones. AARP is mobilizing over 48 million family caregivers 
That's about one in every five voters, 20%. We want them to fight for common sense solutions that will save them time and money to get help get them the support they need. Family caregivers are literally the backbone of a broken long-term care system. They help with everything from buying groceries, managing medications, bathing and dressing loved ones. This, this include parents, grandparents, uh, spouses. They often put their own finances at risk in oftentimes, sometimes their jobs. They provide an estimated 600 billion in unpaid labor each year. This saves taxpayers billions of dollars by keeping loved ones at home and out of costly nursing homes. Both parties can have a huge opportunity to win these voters. Caregivers vote and they make a difference in a close election. AARP is also fighting to protect Social Security. We all have either do now or have worked hard to pay into Social Security. So it's only fair that those individuals expect to get the money they've earned. If Washington doesn't take action in the next 10 years to protect and save Social Security, it could be cut by 20%, an average of about $4,000 per year per beneficiary. AARP is urging Congress to reach a bipartisan solution to protect Social Security for generations to come. I mean, those are just two amazing um, issues and some important, amazing statistics that really warrant, you know, kind of reiterating. I mean, the fact that 48 million family caregivers, that's one in five voters. I mean, that really, I mean, that could make the difference in an election, particularly when you look at four years ago, how close the presidential election was and how tight the battle for Congress was, those voters could really make a difference, right? I mean, it's amazing. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's a vast number of voters and there are 50 plus and the most likely voters among Americans are 50 plus voters. Yeah. And then, you, you know, you talk about Social Security. I mean, you know, I mean, the fact that that all current and future recipients could be looking at a 20 percent cut. I mean, I think that's important to know, you know, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, right. The work that you're all doing, we could fight to make that not be a reality. But it's also important to know that, you know, Social Security isn't going to go broke. I mean, it's not going to disappear, but everybody will be impacted if we don't get this work done. And, and that, that could be that huge cut uh, for everybody moving forward. Uh, absolutely correct, John. Really appreciate the work that you guys are doing as ARP volunteers that are making all of this happen for our members, of which there's almost 650,000 in the state of Connecticut. So who will ARP be focusing these efforts on with, with the 2024 voter engagement campaign work? Like, will we be just talking to incumbent candidates or just one party, either the Democrats or Republicans? So, you know, what, what who will be our focus of, the, of this work? Well, AARP has a long history of advocacy and voter engagement. We fight to get candidates, regardless of party, to offer solutions so the issues that matter to voters 50-plus and their families are at the top of the candidate's agenda if they intend to get elected. And as we have said, voters age 50-plus care about family care, giving support and Social Security. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really amazing. You know, it's something that's always amazed me about my uh, time here at ARP. And I, I know our volunteers know how important it is that ARP is, first of all, right, we're a nonpartisan organization. We don't make endorsements. We don't give to candidates. We don't give to PACs or political parties, right? I mean, we do this work. I um, mean, our really, our goal is to make sure that whomever gets elected from whatever party keeps the issues that our members and the 50 plus voter keep out in the forefront, right? I mean, you guys uh, uh, have a lot of experience with that. So I think what's important for folks to, to really keep that in mind. Okay, so we know what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be talking about uh, this issue with our candidates running for office. So how will ARP volunteers and activists get that message of the 50 plus voter out to those candidates running for Congress and Senate here in Connecticut? Well, we have a plan to do many things. Um, we're gonna deploy multiple tactics, trying to get our message out to 50 plus voters, encouraging them to uh, make sure they vote. And we're going to include, in, we want to have town halls and have volunteers and 50 plus voters attend those town halls and other public events held by, held by candidates for 
all both federal offices, representative and uh, state and, and uh, Senate. We also want to sp sponsor some debates and we're going to have telephone town halls with the candidates. Also, we have already asked candidates to arrange meetings so that we can sit and talk with them. Uh, we're dealing with the campaigns and their, uh, their offices and their staffs. And we want to ask them about their commitment to Social Security and to improving family caregiving. And then we want to share that information, what we learn from the candidates with AARP members and all voters. And you don't have to be an AARP activist or volunteer to get involved in this work. Anybody can join us in this effort, right? Absolutely. Anyone. We welcome all assistance. And that's that's really great because, you know, we we do this work for, for everybody. And, and these are really important issues. And uh, it's important to, to get as many people engaged in this work as possible because, again, we want to make sure whomever wins these elections, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican incumbent or a challenger, that they're on board to really address those issues. So this election, my understanding is that voters will be facing a question, kind of turning gears here a little bit, right? We we, we know we have these federal races, the five congressional districts and the U.S. Senate race, but you know, kind of changing gears, there's going to be a question on the ballot in November. So why don't you guys tell me a little bit about the question and what it means to voters? Well, the ballot question this election involves no excuse absentee balloting. Currently, you need to meet certain criteria to vote by absentee ballot. Those criteria are spelled out in the state constitution. A yes vote in the, during this election on the question will allow the legislator, legislature to write rules on no excuse absentee balloting and a no vote will keep the status quo. So that's important. I mean, I know right now you can only vote by absentee ballot if you meet certain criteria like your own health or, or, or if you're caregiving for somebody who has a medical issue or if you're out of town the entire hours of polling or if you're in the military or you're working in a polling location other than yours. So with this uh, change, if it, the voters decide it's something they want, you would be able to vote by mail absentee at with any reason or no reason at all. No, and if no people reason think at all. Right. No reason at all, right? And, and if they want to not make that change, then it, that would require a no vote. That's something that AARP worked to get on the ballot so that voters would have the right to determine whether or not they thought it was a good idea or not. And that'll be on the ballot in November. So it's important for people to be aware of because I used to be an elections official and the registrar of voters. And so often when there would be questions on the ballot, it would sometimes be hidden in the back or the top or the bottom of the ballot. People wouldn't know they were there and would just not vote on the question, not necessarily because they didn't have an opinion, but just they didn't even know it was on there or they didn't know where it was. So it's important for voters to be aware of that. And it's a it's a major change. And, you know, we don't very often change our state constitution. So uh, folks should be aware of that. So so we talk about that being on the ballot was not too long ago, back in 2022, we had one of our other rare uh, changes in our constitution and, and voters overwhelmingly made a change. So why don't you tell me a little bit about that change and what that change that was made in 2022 to our constitution means for voters here in 2024. That change uh, in uh, uh, to allow early voting as will has and will really assist people's ability to get to the polls and cast their vote. Uh, we've already experienced in the uh, on the April second primary, there was early voting before the day the uh, that Tuesday in uh, on April second um, for allowed people to get to the polls early and cast their ballot for uh, president. And, uh, and many people across the, the, the state did that. Going forward in the uh, uh, primary coming up in August, August 13th, there'll be seven days of early voting starting on August 5th, Monday, and running to Sunday, August 11th. And then for the November 5th election, there'll be 14 days of early voting. And that'll start October 21st on a Monday, and run through Sunday, November 3rd, uh, before voting. So people will have a fabulous opportunity to go to the polls directly on the day of uh, the elections, either the primary or the general election, or to vote 
early where there, where each city and town has set up early voting places. Really looking forward to this. This is a major advancement that Connecticut is experiencing. Prior to that early voting, Connecticut was one of three or four states that didn't have early voting. Now there are only two or three left with no early voting, and Connecticut has joined the uh, the ranks of the more advanced. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because we, we had to only vote on election day because our constitution specifically said election day is the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. So in person voting any day earlier than that would be unconstitutional by the Connecticut constitution. So the voters overwhelmingly said, Hey, we think the the legislature should be able to change that. And they did. And, And I think it's important to note, Jim, every polling, every city and town in the state of Connecticut will have at least one location. It's probably not going to be their regular polling location, but it will have at least one location where they can go in person and vote early. And uh, I availed myself of it during the presidential primaries back in April just to see what it was going to be like. And uh, it's it's somewhat similar to voting absentee, but voting a- absentee in person. Um, and it's really a secure process because you go in and you get a paper ballot, you can go to a privacy area, fill out the ballot, and then it goes into a privacy sealed envelope, and then it gets put into an actually locked ballot box, and then those ballots are counted early on election day, and those tabulations are not released until the close of polls on election day. So it's a it's important for people to understand that, you know, hey, this is a secure, you know, process that is uh really important and that people can and should avail themselves of if they feel it's worth it for them. And and again, you know, we worked very hard when the voters passed this constitutional change to make sure that there were significant and meaningful hours of operation for early voting. That included at least one Sunday. And so we're very glad because there's some people that just couldn't get out any other day than on a Sunday. And we thought that was important to avail the voters of. So Amazing yeah, stuff going for, on. For another example, yeah. Cheshire, for example, uh, and uh, we had on the day of the primary, uh, April 2nd, uh, the, each school was open for primary voting, and that's where all we vote in, uh, in Cheshire. But for the, the, I think the three or four days of early voting, uh, people simply went to town hall, went right. to the registrar of voters' office, and cast their ballot that way. Um, so yep, and that, very, very effective. That's exactly how it worked in my town. Um, we have seven precincts uh, in Ansonia. I'm actually living in Derby now, three precincts. And you could go on election day to your normal precinct, voting early. If you wanted to vote, you went to City Hall and uh, cast your ballot in the registrar or town clerk's office, whatever the designated area is. So um, it was a great uh, process and I felt very comfortable doing it and and it would encourage people if they so choose to, to avail themselves of it. So we've got lots going on. AARP is doing a lot of work to engage the 50 plus voter and the candidates for federal office about family caregiving and social security. Uh, there's going to be a question on the ballot as to whether voters want early or uh, um, excuse, no excuse absentee ballot. People are going to be probably using early voting for the first time ever if they're Connecticut residents. Um, so a lot to learn about what's going on in this election. So where can the public go to learn more about AARP's voter engagement campaign and all the things about voting, like the rules and dates and qualifications and polling locations and so forth? Where should one go to get that kind of information? Go to aarp.org forward slash CT votes. And the information is available from that website. That's about one of the most informed, up-to-date and complete locations that I've ever seen that AARP puts together that that has all things voting. So I would encourage folks to do that. Uh, Jim, anything for the good of the order? No, thank you very much. John, President Wilson, anything from you about uh, anything we've discussed today that you'd like to add? No, but I'm really excited about the combination of, of no excuse absentee voting and early voting, because that is going to bring a lot of people out for the reasons that in the past they said, I can't vote, I don't want to vote, I'm too lazy, I whatever. But those two things alone are going to increase the number of people that come to the polls. And since we started out this with the discussion of the 50 plus voters and how the 50 plus voters make the election and and we are the decision makers, 
uh, that, that's huge. It really is. Well, couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, I certainly do appreciate it. And I appreciate uh, both of you for all the work that you do, uh, not on behalf of just AARP members, but all 50 plus voters on an array of issues, and not just advocacy, whether it's fraud or caregiving or choosing your electric supplier. So much work, our great AARP volunteers, and you two are, are symptomatic of, of some of the best. So uh, with that, uh, you're welcome. I, I'd like to thank both of you and all of you viewing us this morning for tuning into another episode of Coffee and Tea with AARP Connecticut. Join us again in two weeks for another episode. Catch back episodes on demand right here on our Facebook page or on our YouTube page. And you could also scan this QR code to become an e-activist or to help us advance policies important to the age 50 plus person here in Connecticut. So thank you all and have a great day and rest of your week.